I'm Steve Morris, and welcome back to the Web Marketing Adelaide podcast. This week, we're going to be talking about a topic that's been on my to-do list for a long time, um, and I hadn't quite fi- found the right guest to bring on to sort of talk about this topic, which is, of course, email marketing. Uh, certainly, a very relevant topic for web uh, web marketing podcast. And uh, my guest today is our entrepreneur and marketer, and also internet marketing heavyweight, Jamie Stenhouse. G'day, Jamie. Welcome to the show. Cheers for having me, Nick. Uh, thanks for joining us. I know your schedule is very, very busy, so it's <laughs> hard to line things up. Um, are, are you in Adelaide at the moment? Are you travelling somewhere? I'm in Adelaide, yes. Wow, yeah, it's nice to tie you down and in, back in Adelaide. <laughs> but it seems you're always interstate somewhere and emailing me at you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. We're up, we're up. <laughs> Anyway, but it's good to catch you here. And as I said, the the topic today is email marketing. But before we get into that, um, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you do? Sure, sure. Well, I got into this industry about four and a half years ago. I've been working with over 128 clients now and counting. And those clients are across about 62 industries and fields. So I've been able to generate customers online in virtually any niche industry or field. So I've kind of been able to play with tools and techniques a lot and really got a, a great handle on everything in the field of internet marketing, I believe. Awesome. Uh, how did you get your start? Got my start. Interesting. Interesting. I left high school in left year, high school year 10. I did a TAFE course. I was unable to get employed. So I went out on my own, but unfortunately I wasn't so confident in pitching clients personally or even on the telephone as well. So I went into this industry not because I enjoyed it, not because it paid well, but really because I had to. I had to learn how to get customers online for myself because I couldn't acquire customers through any other tool or technique. So I was really pushed into a corner quickly where I had to learn everything I could, apply it, and really push it out very, very quickly. So I kind of feel blessed in a way that I was pushed into that corner because I've learned so much over the last four years and I've been able to achieve a lot more than most internet internet gurus have, I guess, in the four-year time period. So that's really how I kind of got into the industry of internet marketing. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, it, sounds, it sounds like a semi-familiar story. Um, and it's, I guess it's good that uh, uh, the internet marketing industry is, is so uh, you know, big at the moment and it's, it doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime soon. So it's a good space no, to be okay. in. <laughs> uh, it is indeed, let's yeah. get started on a topic for, for tonight, which is um, email marketing, as I, as I said in the introduction. Um, and I wanted to sort of frame this uh, from a sort of a, a top view, uh, first of all, so people can get an idea before we get down to sort of how, how, how do you do it. Um, so if someone ha- has a business already, why, why would they bring in email marketing and how, what can it do for their business strategy overall? In short, I think it's two things. I think it allows them to keep in contact through their current clients. Could be through emailing Promotions, of course, new product lines, and just 
generally keeping in touch for those clients. I also feel email is a great tool to be in contact with at the right place and at the right time as well. So if you set up your campaigns correctly to email, say, a client who could use a product every two to four weeks, then you could almost predict that client coming in each two to four weeks purely from your email marketing campaign. So that's an approach you could take for a new company that is that has clients already, but you can also apply for attracting leads as well. So a tactic I use a lot is by collecting contact information in return for a voucher or a gift card. That does two things. That qualifies the actual lead because they now have cash to put into your company and you have name, email, phone number as well. You can also take the approach of doing an e-book or anything else along those lines too. But I like to use a voucher because it really qualifies them and gives us and gives them a purpose to actually put cash into your business, especially if you have a time period on that voucher. Awesome. Can you explain a little bit more about the voucher thing? So is this a free thing they get or do they have to pay a little bit of money to get the voucher? I don't really quite understand that part. I've seen a few approaches. The most common approach is to give it to them for free, of course, because you attract more leads. However, I've seen the approach of people could pay 20 bucks up front and in return they get a $40 voucher, let's say, and they get examples of your products posted to them too. So for a customer, they put in 20 bucks, they get twice as much back, and they get to try your product first before they purchase. And that really qualifies them really, really quickly as well. Cool. Well, um, let's move on uh, there. We sort of got a little bit ahead of ourselves there, but it's good stuff. Um, in terms of setting up the, the software and the platform that you need to do your email marketing, do you have um, a preference for the, you know what, one of the different systems out there? I mean, there's so many, the Aweber, Things sort of popular, and there's things like Mailchimp, which are free to start off with, which might attract more people to go with them. What are your thoughts on that? I've tried um, all those programs as well as Constant Contact. I've tried as well. Out of all of those, I use and endorse <laughs> Get Response. I've used them for about two years now. And their platform to me is just quick and easy. There's no problems I've had. Um, I've had all the help I can get from them as well. So yeah, getresponsive.com cool. I think it is. And they have Great. a oh. trial account as well. Awesome. I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone who's interested in that. And um, they're sort of similar price to some the most of the others. Very much so. I think all the all the products are quite the same platform in its concept, but I think it's just how they are presented now. So it's just how they set up. Yeah. Everything cool. inside that platform. Yeah. No worries. So people have their platform. Perhaps get response. Um, yeah. And now they're trying to get to just, uh, some s subscribers so they can actually send emails to them. Uh, we just talked about um, the idea of having a voucher, and uh, but also the um, the concept that some people use where they have an ebook or some some sort of giveaway. 
And so this, mm. this, these sort of things, this is usually happening on a website um, of a business or of a personality, like a blog, for instance. Um, and how, how is the best way to set that up? Is there a, a place to put the, the forms that's, that works? And what are some other ways to incentivize or to get people onto that list? All right. I'll answer the form question first. Ideally, putting the form on the right-hand side works quite well. I've also told my clients to include it at the end of each page as well. If you're keen to get really aggressive too, you can also have a light box. And that is pretty much a pop-up that appears as soon as a person comes to your site and says, you know, click here to get a product or guide. So that's how I would set up a form. Um, as far as the content to hand them, there's sort of two approaches that I take. There's the approach of people are coming there who need more information and people who are coming there that are keen to purchase but just need that more persuasion as well. So for people who need information, you could use an ebook or also a video series as well. So each of those products should be positioned around information about your industry and about how you help your customers but not in a pitchy kind of way. So you could give them examples of your past work and how they can apply it to their own campaigns. You can give them tips to avoid as well and then position that around your own company too. You can also interview employees of your corporation so that the prospect is aware that your team is an expert too. So those are three examples just quickly for a free for a product that is positioned around giving people more information about your company. For a more qualified prospect that needs the push, you could give them a voucher as well, which I've already talked about. The other option is you can also do a two for one, of course, but you can also give them a how-to guide. So especially if you're purchasing a program or any sort of product, you can teach them in advance how to use that product and how it can help them in advance before they actually purchase it. So usually if a person isn't convinced on your product, there's usually the price point and a few more things as well. But if you teach them how to use it beforehand, they can sort of picture it almost in their hands and in their sort of everyday life as well. The other one, which is quite common as well, is to give people a free example of your product for name, email, and contact information. Cool. Um, just a few follow-up questions uh, on those things. Um, how do you know... Uh, well, you mentioned uh, the difference between someone who's looking for more information and someone who's, uh, you know, just needs that push to, to become a, a customer. How do you know when you're setting it up which type of people are coming? Or do you set up two different sorts of uh, situations, for one for each, or how do you figure that out? Yeah, yeah. I would set up two forms on your site, of course, but I would set up a form, say, it depends how your site is set up. So if you have a pricing page on there, I would set up the campaign about the customers who need help to just purchase that push. So it would say, 
try product A for 100 bucks, product B for 200, product you know C, D, and then at the end it would say, if you're not sure yet to purchase, try before you buy, or see how to apply this product in your business. For the people who just need more education, I would do that for two things as well. I would do it through a blog, of course, but I would also put your form at the end of your blog and position it around, if you're keen to learn more on X, put in your contact info here. Uh, I would also put it on your homepage too because generally if you have campaigns flying, people won't come to your homepage, right? They'll come to a landing page, contact form, pricing page. So generally anyone who comes to your homepage is a new prospect who hasn't heard of you yet or who needs more information. So always have your homepage tweaked and tuned to capture leads from people who need more information and then push them towards a purchasing choice from there. Awesome, awesome. Um, and, and just one last thing on um, having uh, uh, something there to persuade people to, to sign up, like a, like a free ebook or a free offer or whatever. Um, I mean, I see lots of times around the internet, people have, you know, sign up for my newsletter uh, for, for information, but they don't have any kind of incentive there. What kind of a difference does it make having some, some sort of reason for people to sign up? Is it a big difference or a small difference? Or? Huge difference. I mean, we're now in a time of our lives where people get so much information that if you hand them more, they kind of get a bit scared. So if you take the approach of take our online course to learn X to then apply Y, it's a lot more in enticing as opposed to have some more emails pushed to your inbox, please. If you're really keen to put a, a higher conversion on it as well, you could even time your campaign so each two months you then take that course and change it. So you can say for the next four weeks, come and, per, oh, come and try our course first and you can only try it for the next two weeks, right? So that would give people a time pressure and it would clearly paint the outcome of them applying through that course as well. Cool. Um, that's just some, some great information there. Let, let's move on, I think, um, to, to more of the, the content of the emails themselves that you're going to be sending uh, to these people once you have their details, of course. Um, a few things, I guess, uh, that come to my mind when thinking about what the content of their email be are so the subject line, um, the, the content itself, what's in the email, and then also the format of the email. And rather than just sort of asking you generally what that is, what I've actually done, uh, I'm springing you on this a little bit um, because uh, I didn't tell you this about, about this before, but I've got, gone through some of the emails from your email list that I've been on for a little while. Um, and I've just sort of picked out a few uh, points uh, or things that I just sort of noticed and uh, just I think we'll just sort of discuss each one perhaps and maybe you can give me your sort of thinking behind that and we can sure, hopefully cover right. most of the topic from that. All right. Well, the first, the first thing I sort of noticed was your emails tend to have uh, lots of content in the email, um, almost like uh, rather than say linking off to a blog post, which I've seen other people do, it seems like the blog post is almost in the email itself. What's uh, the thinking behind that uh, versus you know linking off to something else? I'm all about trying to give people as much as I can, as quickly as I can, as easily as I can. So by taking the first two paragraphs of your blog and putting it in an email and then giving them a link to your site, I chose to put the whole content in the email. So usually you have to open up the email and you get halfway into it and you click through into the blog and the whole site loads and you get onto the home page and there's a pop-up, put in your email address, close the pop-up, find your paragraph again, start reading again. It's just, it's too, it's too annoying. So I'm kind of about give people 
the outcome as quickly as you can because it helps them, right? People are flat out and by you helping them in, in advance, by you not taking up an extra 10, 20 minutes of their time, they will open up your emails more and more because your content is all in there. So as opposed to you emailing two free power graphs and then going, oh, it's Jamie again. I have to click through to his blog and close everything else. It is now the actual approach of, oh, Jamie again. I love his emails. They're full of content. Let me sit down, print it, read it, and highlight it. Right? So that is the approach I take for my content emails. Cool. Um, another thing I noticed was um, that you have social sharing buttons in your actual email. So the tweet and like and, and plus one buttons in there. That I guess that's something that GetResponse offers. Um, and I guess is that for just to encourage more sharing? And, and what page do they actually share when they click on that? So if they click on it, it will post a link to their profile of the content itself. So just again, I'm all about putting out as much quality content as I can for free because I really enjoy my topic, right? So by allowing people to pass around content, it just enables me to help more people quite, quite quickly as well. So that's really the only gist of it. I think as well, if they click on it, it will post a link on their profile, of course, but on the actual page itself, it will give people a choice to hop in on my list. So it's sort of a way for people to generate me more leads without mm -hmm. them sort of being aware of it and without me saying, put in your name, email, here, here, here. It is more, it is more people promoting me as opposed to me promoting me. So that's, a, that's, that's why I use that tool. Yeah, yeah. It also seems like it probably um, complements the first thing we went through, where you have lots of content in the email, because now they actually have something to like and share, as opposed to if it's just a few lines and go check out this yeah. thing. It's sort yeah, of a different, yeah. a different thing. Um, the next thing I noticed, um, or another thing I noticed, was that you mix in quite a few news bits of news and updates, which are obviously happening to you sort of recently, like you, it's almost like you saw something and then you decided to just up, update your, do an email straight away that was related to that as opposed to uh, often you kind of get the sense that people have a pre-prepared um, you know, bunch of emails which they sort of set and forget and sort of leave and do it, whereas you seem to be in there changing things all the time. One I noticed was uh, referring to a Colgate ad uh, advertising campaign which was really interesting. And another one, you were just talking about your, your schedule being so crazy and how your email inbox was up to a thousand emails or something. So oh, can you tell us perhaps a, a little bit of the strategy behind um, uh, putting in those those news and bits and pieces? Is this uh, is is there a particular reason for doing that? Is it is it for maybe keeping it a bit fresher or what, what, what are your of. thoughts on that? So I've actually got I think the first. 10 emails on my campaign are pre-framed. So I do have those emails in there, but also I am always traveling every two to four weeks. I actually think I fly out in uh, another four more days. So because I'm always traveling, I like to keep people informed with anything that I learn on the road. Um, the sort of planning behind that is because people get to know me, you know, they know how I talk, they understand that I am hectic, I am a bit weird sometimes, but in in converting leads into prospects, people have to know, like and trust you. So by doing pre-frame content, yeah, it's nice, but it's not real, it's 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 not fresh and it's not personal. So I like to keep people informed about everything that I'm up to, how I'm learning all these cool new techniques and I also, anything that I learn, I'm keen to pass on, be, partly because it helps, because it 
helps me to learn it more so. So people who hang around me will generally hear me talk about a new tactic again, again, and again. So for me to email everyone on my list, it is just sort of a way for me to learn and to share a new tactic as well. Cool, yeah, that's that sounds interesting. I wonder, do you think this this sort of uh, way of doing things would work for uh, you know businesses and things like that? Or is it does it work better perhaps for some you know a business that's an individual person like yourself, or is this a good thing for other people to bring in as well? Do you think? I think everyone can apply. I think for a personal brand, it is quite clear how to use this. But I think for a company, it's a bit unclear. So I'll give you three examples just quickly of how they can use it. So obviously you'd have your 12-week campaign that would push them through content as well. But a company could actually take images of customers purchasing their product right and then email it out to their list and say, hey, here's what you know, here's what our customer has had to tell us about this product, right? So they're actually emailing out a testimonial and they're proving to people that their product is quite good because people are coming in to purchase it. So they could email out testimonials each two to four weeks of customers coming into their place. That's a approach I would take. The other approach as well is just by promoting products as well. So each week or each two to four weeks, they could just choose some, you know, some product here and there and just talk about it and say, you know, here's our new nice product, right? It's you know got this and this and this. Check it out. See you soon. And the other thing you could do as well is by just invite them down, say, hey, you know, it has been a bit quiet here. Can we come in and just have a coffee, talk to you, and can we teach you about our new product? You know, like there's not any pressure to purchase, but just come in, say hello, and we hope to see you soon. So all of those examples are quite personal and they aren't very pushy as well. It's just keeping in contact for those clients at the right time. Cool, cool. Um, another thing uh, I noticed, one we've already been over, but uh, the personalization, and I know this is a, well, if people don't know, this is something you can do within the, the email software. When people give their name, when they sign up, for instance, Nick, I gave my name, and I've noticed that my name will appear often within your emails uh, a few times. Um, does this uh, in increase the chance of um, of me clicking on things or how does the using that name help with, with the email strategy? I, I use the actual username as a attention grabber. So as you were saying before, I have quite long emails, so what tends to happen is that people will get for the email, they will get tired, they'll get tired, so you put in a name halfway and it says, Nick, you're like, oh, okay, and then you keep reading, you get a little bit tired, you're like, Nick, you're like, oh, oh, so it's kind of keeps them awake throughout your email constantly, right? So this is what a lot of people don't use. They say, hi, Nick, and then they go, blah, 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 and you're like, oh my god, this is so plain and boring. So by using a name again and again and again, it's almost as if you're calling them to sort of pay attention to your content. So yeah, that's the approach I take in all my emails. I think I might use a name up to four, five, you know, eight times maybe if it's a long email, be because I want the person to really get. I feel that I am talking to them and that I want them to, to pay attention to it as well, right? So by having their name in there, it keeps them 
engage throughout the whole content. Awesome, yeah. I definitely, now that you sort of explain it, I, I can see exactly how you, you've done that in, in the emails. And I, there's, you can't help but notice your, your own name, especially in that, in that context where it, it's, often it's less a personal because you know it's an email list. It's very, it's very interesting to hear you explain how uh, each, each thing, the, the thinking behind each thing and how it all, obviously all fits together, like with the long emails and with the personalization and the, um, uh, the putting the personal touches in there as well. Um, and just the last thing I wanted to ask you about on this sort of little topic is um, the fact that you don't seem to have very many promotional emails. There are lots and lots of information, lots of content, and you've already sort of explained that a little bit. But in general, is there a rule of thumb as to how much you know, promotion versus non-promotion content uh, a business or someone should put in their emails? Or is, is it to, you know, depend from industry to industry? Or? I think from industry to industry, it does depend. And it also depends on your product as well. So if you're pitching Cologne, you might email a campaign to them each four to five weeks because that is how long it takes for a person to go through a whole cologne bottle. But generally I like to use uh, 10 to 1, so 10 content to a sales pitch. But again, it depends how quickly you are keen to earn some cash. So if you need to get paid quickly, you might have four to one, you know, so you email out them four weeks and then you pitch a product. So that could equal out to 12 times cash injections per year. So it's really up to how you want your email to work for you. If you're keen for it to be a constant cash injection over each 12 to 8 weeks, then yeah, time it like that. But if you're keen to sort of just hand out content continuously and then pitch every half a year or every two to three months, then yeah, take that approach as well. There's not any correct answer. It is generally about your outcomes around email marketing and what you're keen to achieve from the program. Cool, cool. Um, moving on, uh, what are some of the I mean, the email programs, I mean, I use Aweber, but, and you, you can, there's lots of sort of statistics you can get in the back end there about open rates and click-through rates, and uh, you can see a nice little graph of things and how your subscribers are growing. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, wondering what sort of metrics you, you think are important for people to pay attention to when they're doing email marketing. I think the most important is the open rate, right? Because if people don't hear you, well, that's sort of it, right? Like they, they can't purchase from you if they haven't heard of you. So by pushing for that first and then for the click-through, yes. But what I tend to do, which is quite, not tedious, but quite persistent, is I might email out everyone on a Tuesday, right? And I know that everyone gets, say, 100 emails per day. So if on a Wednesday they haven't clicked on it, sorry, if they haven't and opened it, I'll email them again on that day to the people who haven't actually clicked on it and opened it yet. So on the Tuesday I might get, say, 60% right. And then on... Wednesday, I'll email the last 40%, but I'll change the actual heading line and I'll change it to a more enticing line because if they haven't opened it the first time, it is because your actual content line hasn't been interesting enough. So I would tweak it and then I would blast it out a second time and I might get, say, another 10%. So then I would keep on going down four, five, ten times until everyone on my list has opened that email. Everyone. I've been, <laughs> I've had times where I think there was like two or three 
percent left and it took me like two weeks. I'm like, keep changing this line until they open it. And they opened it. I was like, yes, enjoy that content. So it's just about being persistent and keeping an eye on your charts and then emailing people who haven't actually clicked on your link. So if they haven't clicked on it, it is either because your link is too far down or your content is too long. So shorten your content, change your link up to the higher point and blast it out a second time and change around the content as well. Awesome, awesome. That's a really interesting tip there which I've not heard of before and it's, it's cool that you just keep on going. Is that a manual process to keep on doing that? Or can you Very automate manually. that? Somehow? It's definitely <laughs> manual. Just, you've got to keep tweaking so, it. Yes, indeed. So, Nick, if you don't open my emails, I am coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> I always open like, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right, cool, yeah. That's a cool tip. It, it kind of gels well, I guess, with follow-up when you're doing sales and stuff like that. It makes sense that, you know, sometimes you might catch someone at the bad time and they have a lot of emails, but if you email them again, you get eventually you'll get them at a good time, hopefully. Um, exactly. And uh, I guess following on from that, um, I mean, it's probably we could do a whole new interview, I guess, on just on subject uh, lines and, and how to get the best open rates based on those. But do you have any sort of quick tips or ideas on um, how to write subject lines that people would generally open? Indeed. Again, it comes comes down to people trusting you and knowing you and liking you, right? So. All my content lines are very, very personal. I think you would agree as well. So it's almost as if I'm talking to you. Like, I don't enjoy to use lines that are, you know, click here to learn X or, I don't know, what's another one? You know, 12 ways, you know, to do Y. So I always keep them very personal as well. So I like to include a bit of my personality in the actual content line so that people understand it is me talking to them and that I am not trying to just pitch them some product but I am keen to just talk to them really. Cool. Um, just quickly, I want to add something else. Yeah. So you could position that around your branding as well. So if your branding is quite quirky, then include that in your emails, you know. Even if you're pitching a new product, include it quite quirky too. But if your branding is quite plain and quite, and quite you know, just clean cut, then keep your emails towards that clean cut and try to avoid any huge, huge, caps locks or any real sort of power words as well. So keep your emails linked to your branding as well and you'll find you'll get quite a high rate of opens. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, I guess pretty much that brings me to the end of my, my questions. I just wanted to, there's, there's a theme that's been running through I think which uh, will be interesting to sort of pick up on uh, which is uh, a lot of personalization and a lot of um, speaking to the, the person that you're emailing as a person as opposed to as, as a company necessarily. Um, and obviously you are a person and you're a personality within your uh, business. Um, but I guess for a bigger business, um, it would be, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts on if it's worth them trying to be more personal, perhaps um, Having appointing someone who is the, the you know the email marketer and they become a person and speak to the customer as a person because I hear that similar sort of, sort of advice uh, applied to blogging and to social media in some senses uh, especially Twitter so I wonder if is perhaps is this a strategy you can carry along to email or what are your thoughts on that I think it is as well I think keeping Business has changed a lot in the last 10 years, so it's kind of gone from where this huge corporation to we are now this nice personal brand that you can really talk to us through. So by carrying that 
across all of your platform platforms, <laughs> including email marketing, I think people will really get adjusted to it. So let's say you have a persona on every other platform, then you should include that on email marketing as well. So you have a character on Twitter that's called Jim, right? And people hear of Jim, Jim's quite hilarious, Jim holds up his, his you know, product every now and then. So people are keen to hear from Jim in the emails. You go, hey, you know, this is Jim. How are you? You know, so people kind of get to know Jim and can really look forward to hearing from Jim and his adventures, really. Yeah, great. I mean, that that seems to make sense. As I said, it seems to gel well with the personalization of these other mediums like, uh, like blogging and like social media. So I think that's a pretty cool tip for people to take away who are listening to this. As I said, this that pretty much brings me to the end of, of my questions. Did you have anything uh, in particular you wanted to sort of draw out as a key po key point for people to take away or something, anything additional you want to add about email marketing? Three points, I think. Keep things personal. Don't pitch too much. And... Focus on giving first, and the cash will come afterwards. Awesome. Great uh, three tips to finish off. Um, thanks very much, Jamie, for joining us uh, on this uh, interview. Uh, it's been... That's right. uh, and saying, thanks for being, for being such a good sport, even though I <laughs> strung some of those uh, uh, questions on you about, um, about your own email marketing campaigns, um, and, and even when put on the spot, uh, you, you negotiated the questions very well. So thanks for coming on, and it's been really uh, good having you and having your insights on this topic. Not a problem. Not a problem. Um, if anyone wants to find out more about you and what you do, what's the best place that they can do that at? They can check out my personal site, which is jamiestenhouse.com. So, yeah, head there, um, check out my email list. I can email you a cool content about everything that I'm up to as well. I won't pitch you too much, as you've heard from Nick. So, yeah, hop on board and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> awesome, mate. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'll put all the links that we've mentioned in this uh, call in the, uh, on the website there, including uh, links to Jamie's website as well. So thanks very much, very mate. Much. Have a good one. No worries, Nick, and hopefully I will chat to you again shortly. Definitely.